Ah, for the good old days. Wasn't that a beautiful Model T? And then again, wasn't that a beautiful BMW? It all depends on your point of view. One thing is for certain, the old cars were easy to repair. Well, things have changed. Added conveniences and government regulations, anti-skid and airbags, four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering, even environmental temperature control. The method? Electronics, computers, the little black box. The Corporate Training Department of Standard Motor Products presents this video training program as part of our continuing effort to keep you up to date on how to repair today's cars and remain profitable. This high-grade fuel systems training module covers the Honda electronic fuel injection system. In order to competently and profitably repair this system, the mechanic must have certain hand tools and test equipment. Also, he should have a working knowledge of the basics of fuel injection and have an understanding of the engine computer control system. He should also be familiar with the concepts of open loop and closed loop. And most important, he should be familiar with electrical and electronics diagnostic procedures. By now, I'm sure you're wondering, where is this program going? What will I learn? I don't work on import cars. Well, you're not alone. Many mechanics don't think they work on import cars. But what is a Ford probe? Who makes the Chevy Prism? It's probably safe to say that aside from factory dealers or import specialists, most mechanics do not feel comfortable with what they know about import cars. So as you follow along with this video program, we will supply you with the information needed to profitably repair the Honda PGM fuel injection system and the computer control system that regulates it. Ready? Before we actually begin working on the Honda system, what is it trying to accomplish? What does each of the components do? And how do they interact with each other to affect the operation of the vehicle? The main purpose of the entire system is to allow the vehicle to give good fuel mileage and meet the federal emission standards, but not at the expense of customer satisfaction in relation to good acceleration and smooth operation. Before we go into the details of Honda's PGM FI system, it is important to remember that all fuel injection systems can be split into three basic subsystems. One, the air management system. Two, the fuel control system. And three, the influence of the engine control computer on fuel and air delivery. As you can see on this Honda, the main components of the air management system consist of the air filter and ductwork and the throttle body assembly. On the throttle body assembly is a dash pot for manual transmission vehicles and dash pot check valve, a series of vacuum ports, and an idle adjusting screw. On the other side of the throttle body is the throttle angle sensor. Also part of the air management system is this fast idle mechanism mounted on the side of the throttle body. Included on part of the air management system are a series of air bypass valves and solenoid assemblies. These include the idle control valve, an automatic transmission idle control solenoid valve, and air conditioning boost solenoid valve. The solenoids are centrally located in the control box adjacent to the firewall. The fuel control system consists of an electric fuel pump mounted in the fuel tank. Its output travels through a very fine filter mounted on the firewall. The fuel then travels to the fuel rail and into the individual fuel injectors. To maintain pressure in the fuel system, there is a fuel pressure regulator on the end of the fuel rail. Excess fuel not used by the injectors travels through this regulator and back to the fuel tank. The Honda computer control system has been used extensively throughout their model lineup since the early 80s. This control system is even utilized in many of the carbureted vehicles. Remember, as we study the system, most of the information is directly applicable to the Acura Integra and Legend sedans, and also to the Sterling. It is important to note that during this program, we'll be studying the engine control computer and the program fuel injection system. The computer interacts with the ignition and emission control systems also. Details concerning those systems can be found by studying the Standard Motor Products Ignition Systems Training Program on Honda. 
details of the engine computer control system show that the ECU receives sensor input information from a crank angle sensor signaling engine speed and to sequence the injectors. A manifold absolute pressure sensor measures vacuum. A vehicle speed sensor. A coolant temperature sensor signal triggers the system for cold startup. An intake air temperature sensor. A throttle angle sensor aids in information used for acceleration and deceleration fuel cutoff feedback. An oxygen sensor sends information to adjust fuel injection pulse width. A battery voltage input. A starter signal. An atmospheric pressure sensor. And a series of miscellaneous switches, including an air conditioning compressor switch, an automatic transmission switch, etc. The computer utilizes the sensor input information and processes it along with internal pre-programmed memory. The computer then responds with signal outputs to various control devices, including the fuel pump, main relay, the injectors, the EGR control valve, various idle speed control solenoids, and an ignition timing solenoid. By now, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that Honda does not utilize a cold startup injector assembly. The engine computer merely lengthens the fuel injection pulse width under certain temperature conditions to enrich in the fuel mixture for startup. Also, as you can see, the system does not utilize a mass airflow sensor or a Bosch-style vane airflow meter. In fact, this system is of the speed density style, not the mass airflow style. You should keep in mind that the sensor inputs from the crank angle sensor and absolute pressure sensor, along with pre-programmed memory, actually control the basic fuel discharge pulse width. Also, along with the throttle angle sensor, they control fuel cutoff at high engine speed to prevent engine overspeed and fuel cutoff during deceleration to help improve emission control. All of the remaining sensor inputs, coolant temperature sensor, intake air temperature, throttle angle, the oxygen sensor, and the atmospheric pressure sensor are utilized for fuel pulse width compensation or modification. The fuel pump control system is designed to shut off the power to the fuel pump to prevent the pump and the injectors from discharging fuel in case of an accident. Another bit of information you should remember is that the computer has a fail-safe or limp-in mode the computer controls the fuel system and supplies a fixed rate of fuel when the ECU detects a failed sensor or a problem in itself. This operating mode will at least allow the vehicle to return to the repair facility, although it may not run very well. Before we begin working on some problems on various Honda automobiles, let's take a closer look at some of the components. The engine has two magnetic pickups. One is called TDC, or Top Dead Center. It supplies a signal which serves to indicate when injection should take place on each cylinder. Also, the TDC sensor signals engine speed. The second signal, a CYL, or Cylinder Position Sensor, is utilized to detect number one cylinder as a basis for the sequential fuel injection system. Honda utilizes a stack of resistors to reduce the current flow to the fuel injectors. Honda's injectors utilize a very reduced number of coil windings in their injectors to increase the rise time or opening time of the injector. Due to the very low resistance of the injectors, the current limiting resistors are installed in series to prevent the injectors from burning out. That's it. We have covered the basic components and functions of the Honda Program Fuel Injection System. Now, let's repair some common problems. Hands-on experience may be the best teacher, but through the use of video, we can simulate everything except your hands actually touching the components. Ready to begin? Since the diagnostic procedures are almost identical on all Hondas, Acuras, and Sterlings, we will review each of the engine styles during the process of repairing some common problems found on Honda vehicles. It is important to always consult service literature for exact diagnostic trouble codes and component part resistance or voltage values before beginning to work on any particular problem. The key to a successful and profitable repair on any Honda is to follow a logical approach to troubleshooting. 
First, always ask the customer the questions necessary to determine exactly what the complaints are. Remember, you cannot diagnose a problem that doesn't exist. Keep in mind that the self-diagnostic system on this vehicle or any vehicle cannot troubleshoot everything. There are certain things that should be checked visually or with some simple test equipment, like a volt ohm meter or a fuel pressure gauge, before beginning to work on any of the components in the system. Since we will not be discussing any particular component problem, let's follow through the diagnostics and repair procedure on some commonly heard customer complaints and utilize the onboard diagnostic system following a logical troubleshooting procedure. The first hint of a vehicle problem, other than a complaint of drivability or hard starting, will be when the dashboard indicator light for the PGM FI system lights during engine operation or stays on for an extended period of time once the vehicle has started. This will normally bring the customer into your shop. Let's take a look at this Honda. The customer's complaint has been nothing more than the check engine light has been on. Let's follow through the diagnostic trouble tree and isolate the particular problem. So that you won't be searching all over the vehicle for the engine control computer and the diagnostic readout lights, we'll show you where they are. Honda Prelude locates the computer and diagnostic assembly on the left-hand side of the vehicle, adjacent to the left rear passenger seat, or as Honda would say, on the driver's rear pillar post. Also, the atmospheric pressure sensor is located adjacent to the computer. On other models, including the Sterling and the Acura, the engine control computer can be found underneath one of the front seats. It is not necessary to remove the seat. It has been done here for illustration purposes only. Also, do not remove the top cover from the computer. It has been done to illustrate the componentry on the inside. As you can see, the computer is a very sophisticated assembly. With the computer positioned so that we can get a better look at the LEDs, you will see that there are two lights, a red and an orange. Some other computers may have only a red light. In these two styles, the computer trouble codes will be read out as flashes of the red light. You merely count the number of flashes. A third style engine computer contains four LEDs. As you can see from this illustration, the first light signifies a unit or a one. The next light signifies a two. The next light indicates a four. And the last light indicates an eight. As you can see, lighting a combination of the one light and the two light, we have a trouble code three, they add. A trouble code four is an individual light. A five is a four light and a one light. Obviously, a six would be a four light and a two light. And eight, the individual eight light. A 13 is an eight, a four, and a one. Utilizing these four lights, any possible combination exists. It is important that you consult service literature on the exact year and model of vehicle being tested to derive the exact trouble codes and the corresponding component. The last thing to be concerned about is if the number of light flashes or blinks exceeds 13 or if the trouble code indicator stays lit. If it does, then you probably have a faulty engine control computer. Turning on the key to start self-test, we show a one code followed by a pause then by another one. A one signifies no particular symptom or component has malfunctioned, but that the idle speed is erratic. This can be caused by either an injector, a fuel system problem, or problem in the oxygen sensor circuit. We're going to follow Honda's step-by-step -step procedure for a code one, and during the process, we will check out most of the subcomponents in the fuel control system. This will be the best way to illustrate how to diagnose problems on a Honda. Some of the remaining trouble codes specifically signify a component malfunction. For example, a 5 means that the manifold absolute pressure sensor has a problem. An 8 signifies a crank angle sensor fault. And a 10 is a faulty intake air temperature sensor, all easy to verify and repair. The first step in the diagnostics for a one trouble code is to make sure that there is no problem with the spark plugs or the spark plug wires that can cause a misfire. A misfire can initiate a false trouble code one in the engine control computer. After checking the plugs and wires, continue with the diagnostics. Start the engine and allow it to come to operating temperature. 
Once at temperature, check the oxygen sensor voltage and or wiring. The oxygen sensor is the best key to the condition of the fuel system, whether it is running rich or lean, whether we have a bad fuel injector, etc. Monitor the voltage output with a digital voltmeter. A good connection point is at the oxygen sensor itself. An alternate connection can be found at the computer harness. You can even use a Honda breakout box installed at the computer. Slowly increase and decrease the engine RPM. As the RPM increases, the voltage should increase. As the RPM falls, the voltage should fall. Quickly accelerate the engine to approximately 4,000 RPM. You should read between 6 and 7 tenths of a volt. Allow the engine to come back to idle. The voltage should drop down close to 3 tenths of a volt. Let's check the response of the fuel injectors and the regulator. Disconnect the vacuum hose from the fuel pressure regulator and plug it. Utilizing a vacuum pump, apply approximately 30 millimeters of vacuum to the regulator. Again, raise the engine speed to about 4,000 RPM. Note that the voltage of the oxygen sensor should be above 6 tenths of a volt. With vacuum applied, we're allowing maximum fuel available by controlling the fuel pressure regulator. If the voltages do not fall within the correct ranges, or if the response is extremely slow, replace the oxygen sensor. Since we still have a trouble code 1, and the oxygen sensor appears to be okay, let's proceed with a component-by-component -component check of the fuel system. The first test should be performed is to check the system's fuel pressure. The correct procedure calls for disconnecting the fuel pipe on top of the fuel filter to relieve the fuel pressure. Cover the area with a rag. Caution! With the engine off, you must relieve the fuel pressure in the fuel system in a careful manner. Always avoid allowing fuel to come into contact with hot engine components. Do not smoke while working on the fuel system. Install the fuel pressure gauge at the filter utilizing the proper adapter. Always utilize new washers whenever the banjo fitting is removed. With the gauge properly installed, start the engine. Measure the fuel pressure with the engine idling and the vacuum hose to the fuel regulator disconnected and plugged. Specification calls for 36 pounds per square inch or 255 kilopascals. If the fuel pressure is higher than specified, the fault is probably that of the fuel pressure regulator. If the fuel pressure is lower than specified, you can check for a plugged fuel filter, a bad fuel pump, or a faulty fuel pressure regulator. Let's check the operation of the fuel pressure regulator. Reattach the vacuum hose to the pressure regulator. The fuel pressure should drop. Shut off the engine and observe the fuel pressure gauge. The fuel pressure should hold steady. Over a 5 or 10 minute period of time, there should be no substantial pressure drop. If there is a pressure drop, you must determine whether it's the fuel pressure regulator or drain back valve in the fuel pump or a leaky injector. A simple way to isolate the component is restart the engine and charge the fuel pressure rail. Shut the engine off and crimp the fuel return line between the regulator and the fuel tank. Monitor the pressure gauge. If the pressure gauge does not drop, you have isolated the regulator. If it continues to drop, recharge the fuel rail. Pinch the pressure hose on the inlet side of the fuel filter and monitor the gauge. If the pressure leak or pressure drop stops, you have isolated the fuel pump. If we continue to have a pressure drop, you may suspect a leaky injector. While we have the fuel pressure gauge attached, let's do a fuel injector balance test. We can do this in a number of ways. One, run the engine and monitor the engine's tachometer and alternately connect and disconnect each individual injector, monitoring the idle speed drop. The idle drop should be the same on each cylinder. If there is no noticeable engine speed drop, that particular fuel injector is not contributing fuel. Before replacing the injector, two other tests should be done. One, measure the resistance of the injector. Resistance should be 1.5 to 2.5 ohms. If not as specified, the injector must be replaced. Next, monitor the voltage to the fuel injector with the engine running. It should fluctuate between 0 and 2 volts as the injector is fired.
If the voltage is correct, yet the injector does not contribute power, the injector needs replacement. If there is no voltage available to the particular injector, check the power available from the resistor stack and or the wiring. With the engine turned off, disconnect the wiring harness to the resistor stack. As you can see from this illustration, the resistance between A and B, A and C, A and D, and A and E should be between 5 and 7 ohms each. Remember, you're looking for an open resistor. If any resistor is found bad, the entire resistor stack must be replaced. An alternate test method would be done utilizing a fuel injection test box. The method, pulse each injector and monitor the fuel pressure drop. Before we do an injector replacement, try cleaning the injectors. The injectors may only be clogged or fouled. Flushing the fuel injectors with an approved cleaning solvent and gasoline can quickly restore original performance to any vehicle with clogged injectors. Proper procedure, shut off the engine and remove the key. Relieve the fuel pressure in the system. Next, remove the fuse that powers the fuel pump or if necessary, disconnect the power lead to the fuel pump itself. Restrict the return line to the fuel tank so that the cleaning solvent will not be forced back to the fuel tank. With a pressurized tank or canister attached to the fuel system, restart the engine. Check for leaks. Run the engine on the fuel and solvent in the pressurized canister until the engine stalls. Disconnect the pressurized canister, install new washers on the banjo fitting at the fuel filter, and reconnect the fuel line. Reinstall the fuse to the fuel pump and remove the restriction from the fuel return line. Check all fuel fittings for tightness. Restart the engine. Immediately check for leaks. If the vehicle continues to run poorly or still exhibits a lack of power, it will be necessary to replace the fuel injectors. We will illustrate the procedure on this Acura. The procedure is almost identical on any Civic or Accord. With the ignition off and the key out of the switch, relieve any fuel pressure in the fuel system. Disconnect the fuel line couplers and banjo fittings on the end of the fuel rail both the pressure line and the return line. Remove the fuel rail retaining bolts. Remove any electrical or vacuum hoses that will restrict the removal of the fuel rail and the injectors. Unplug each individual injector. Caution, do not lose or misplace the injector wiring retaining clips. Next, lift up on the fuel rail. It is not uncommon for the injectors to stay stuck in the engine block, depending on how hard the O-rings have become. With the rail out of the way, remove any of the remaining injectors, O-rings, spacers, etc. Carefully clean the area around each fuel injector hole in the cylinder head. Install four new O-rings. As an alternate method, it may be more convenient to install the new O-rings on the injectors themselves. Lightly lubricate the O-ring and install it on the injector or in the cylinder head. Lightly lubricate a new O-ring and install it on the top of each injector. With the rail thoroughly cleaned, reinstall the fuel injectors into the rail. Make sure that the fuel pipe and the fuel injectors are aligned to the correct position and that the alignment marks on the rail and the injectors match. Now, carefully lower the fuel rail and the injectors onto the engine. Carefully insert each injector into its appropriate hole in the engine block. Install the fuel rail spacers. Before installing the retaining bolts, make sure that each injector moves freely and is properly aligned to both the rail and the cylinder head. Install and torque the retaining bolts. Reinstall each injector's wiring harness, double-checking that the wire clip is in the proper position and that the harness snaps into place. Reinstall the fuel return line and the fuel pressure line utilizing new washers and torque the bolts to the proper specifications. Lastly, reinstall any vacuum hoses or electrical wiring that was removed during disassembly. Restart the engine and check for fuel leaks. That's it. We have tested the entire fuel system, flushed the fuel injectors and replaced them. On this V6, changing the injectors on the other rail would be done in the same manner.
there are very few components remaining in the fuel injection system. But let's take a closer look at how you would test and or adjust one of the idle control solenoid valves. Remember, we have an idle control solenoid valve, a fast idle control solenoid valve, an automatic transmission idle control solenoid valve, and an air conditioning idle boost solenoid valve. They all work pretty much the same way, and they all perform the same function. Start the engine and turn on the air conditioner. You should hear the valve click, and the engine speed should increase, or at least maintain, as the air conditioning compressor is turned on. Turn off the air conditioning. The engine speed should stay relatively stable, but you should hear the solenoid valve de-energize. If the engine were to stall when the air conditioner were turned on, or if there were a substantial increase in engine speed, the valve should be checked. The first step would be to disconnect the electrical connector on the side of the control box. We will energize the solenoid valve manually to double check the solenoid function. Connect a set of jumpers to the battery and power the solenoid directly. Connect the battery positive terminal to the black and yellow terminal on the control box coupler and the negative battery terminal to the red terminal on the box. The solenoid should energize. The only other possible cause of malfunction is a mechanical problem in the valve. Since the solenoid valve checks properly, reconnect the power plug on the side of the control box and restart the engine. If the engine idle speed still drops off, you'll need to adjust the AC idle boost valve located near the master cylinder. Turn on the air conditioner. The idle speed should maintain at about 750 RPM. If it is still dropping off, turn the adjusting screw on the valve about half of a turn and check the idle speed again, turning the air conditioning system on and off and watching the tachometer. Once you've adjusted this valve, you should make sure that the automatic transmission idle speed RPM range remains in the specified position. Next, turn on the headlights, the rear window defogger, and turn the air conditioning system off. It should still maintain idle. One last system that should be checked is called a fuel cutoff system. It is designed to aid in increasing fuel economy by interrupting the fuel injector signal on deceleration. This is a very simple test to perform. Start the engine and let it come to operating temperature. Make sure it idles smoothly. Disconnect the vacuum hose from the dash pot at the throttle body. Using a stethoscope or screwdriver as a stethoscope, place it next to a fuel injector. Increase the engine RPM to about 3,000 and quickly release the throttle. The clicking of the injector should cease momentarily when the throttle is released. If the clicking does not cease, the system is not functioning properly. The controller is the ECU. It supplies the ground path for the fuel injectors. The trigger is the throttle angle sensor. It is easy to check the throttle angle sensor using a simple volt ohm meter. Use the ohm meter and measure the resistance across the two outside terminals, that is, the yellow with white hash and the green with the white hash wires. Specifications call for between 4,000 and 6,000 ohms. If out of specifications, loosen the two mounting screws for the throttle angle sensor and attempt to adjust it. If it cannot be brought into specification, the sensor must be replaced. When the sensor is replaced, it can be reinstalled utilizing the resistance measurements already listed. It is also possible and preferable to do a voltage test utilizing a digital voltmeter. Measure voltage at pins C7 and C12 of the computer. With the sensor installed and plugged into the harness, turn on the ignition switch. Rotate the sensor until 0.48 to 0.52 volts across C12 and C7 has been reached. Then lightly tighten the screws. Restart the engine and recheck the fuel cutoff system. If it checks correctly, tighten the screws. That's it. We have shown proper testing and replacement procedures on many of the components in the fuel system. We have also rectified an on-vehicle problem utilizing the diagnostic system. The final step in any repair is to road test the vehicle and verify repair of the customer's complaint. This concludes working on the Honda PGM fuel injection system. As you have seen, it is not difficult to troubleshoot and repair utilizing some simple test procedures. 
I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of Standard Motor Products and its corporate training department to thank you for purchasing this video, and we hope you will consider us for your future replacement parts needs.